If you're interested in group theory, you may have heard about monoids. Monoids are not too difficult to understand, and in this video I want to share a specific way of thinking about them. The goal is to show exactly why monoids are defined the way they are. The simplest example I can think of starts with several piles of books. And now you get a single operation that you can perform. You can take exactly two of these piles and stack one on top of the other. The result of this operation, of course, is a new, larger pile of books. And this is the only thing you're allowed to do. This operation, which I'm calling stack here, takes exactly two inputs. This is called a binary operation. It always takes two and only two piles of books, and then it produces a new pile as its output. In math, even when you've only been given a tiny number of allowed operations, it often pays to ask yourself, what else can I do? Are there any tricks that allow me to use this operation in an unexpected way. For example, what if you had three books instead of two and you wanted to stack those together? At this point, you don't have any way of doing that. I didn't give you a ternary operation, one that takes three inputs, but that shouldn't stop you. You can get a little bit creative here and just perform two binary stack operations one after the other. So, for example, you first use the binary operation to stack book 2 on top of book 1, creating a small pile, and then you use the operation again to stack book 3 on top of that pile. Great, so you manage to take three books and create a pile from them. But there is a detail here that we have to pay attention to, and this is actually crucial if you want to understand why monoids are defined the way they are. You see, there's more than one way of stacking three books on top of each other. Here, I will show you the first way again. We began by applying our stack operation to the first two books, and then we stacked the third book on top of that pile. But there is also a different way. We can first apply our operation to the second and third books, and then after that we put the resulting pile on top of the first book. Let's look at that again. So there are two different orders in which you can apply your two binary operations. And if we want our stacking operation to work correctly, we have to make sure that these different ways of stacking always give us the same result. This key property is known as associativity. So in order to make our ternary operation work, we demand that our binary operation must be associative. You can now easily extend the stacking operation to four, five, and more piles of books. You always simply stack them two by two using the original binary operation. And no matter the order in which you do this, you always get the same result, thanks to the fact that stacking is associative. Perfect. So I gave you an operation on two inputs and you can now extend it to any larger number of inputs. But there are still a few special cases that we haven't covered yet. Let's start with the number one. How do you create a pile of books from only one input pile? Well, the most obvious thing to do is to just use the pile itself, right? But remember, our operation needs two inputs. One of those inputs can be our pile of books, but what do we use for the second input? If you think about it for a while, you might come up with a clever trick. You could use an empty pile of books as the second input. As you can see, when I stack this empty pile on top of the other pile, we just end up with the original pile. That's exactly what we wanted. We can now take any single input and just stack nothing on top of it. So this extends our binary operation to cases where we have only a single input. The empty pile is called the neutral element because it doesn't do anything. It remains neutral. You can stack it as often as you like and it never changes the pile that you put it on top of. It is also known as the identity element because it leaves the original pile identical to itself. As it happens, 
the empty pile also covers the other special case. What happens when we have zero inputs? In other words, how can we pile no books on top of each other? Well, just use our binary operation on these two empty piles. I know it looks weird, but after stacking two empty piles on top of each other, we end up with an empty pile. So we now know how to apply our binary operation to zero inputs. We have reached a point where we have all the pieces of a typical monoid. We have a set of elements, piles of books, and we have a binary operation, stacking. The operation is associative, and it has a neutral element. That is the definition of a monoid. A monoid is any set of elements with a binary operation that satisfies these rules. Now, like many definitions in abstract algebra, this one seems a bit arbitrary at first. In fact, if someone gave you this definition without any context, you'd probably think that this is just some arbitrary set of rules. I mean, why exactly these rules and not others? Well, now that you've seen a concrete example of a monoid, you should notice that every single piece of this definition plays a unique and crucial role. The binary operation of the monoid allows you to combine two elements into a new one. The fact that it's associative allows you to combine three, four, and more elements. The elements of the monoid themselves give us the result of combining, well, a single element. And the neutral element takes care of the case where we want to operate on zero inputs. So the key thing that a monoid does is extend a binary operation with two inputs to any number of inputs, including zero and one. And this all happens in a very natural way. This is why monoids are so common in higher algebra. They basically encode how you operate on multiple objects. They explain how simple operations can be combined into longer operations. You can probably think of a few dozen examples of mathematical objects that we can perform operations on. You can add natural numbers together. You can subtract one equation from another. You can multiply matrices. You can create longer strings from shorter ones. And all these operations are, deep down, governed by the four simple rules of monoids. Monoids are everywhere because they define what it means to operate on any number of mathematical objects. Finally, I have to talk briefly about inverses. Remember that I gave you an operation that adds new books to a pile. If you want to remove books from a pile, you're stuck. You have no operation that does that. You would have to imagine a kind of books made from antimatter or something, so that when you drop one on top of the pile, it destroys itself and the book that it lands on. If you want, you can think of these as negative books. After all, when you add a negative number, you really subtract from your total. These kinds of antimatter books, or negative numbers, are called inverses. As soon as you add inverses to your monoid, it becomes a group. And that's a story for another video. Thank you so much for watching.